Hello everyone, tonight I'll be narrating three new creepy posts that I found off of the Let's Not Meet subreddit. After you've heard these stories, let me know what you think of them in the comments below, you be the judge. But without further ado, let's dive straight into their experiences. These are their stories. This happened to me two years ago. It was my first month on the job, and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. I'm a 38 year old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life in the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well known concert venues for years, so I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. The place I currently work is a resort style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartments with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in the back, indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers, and real estate agents and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It is located in a well-known tourist town in the United States. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor. The doors are locked at 11pm. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you are at. It will ring the company's cell phone and I answer and can come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on first floor are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a code to get in. This was midsummer, and while it's never really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off the keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I am the only security person here at night. A co-worker who was leaving told me the side iron gates that led to the parking lot are open on one side because they are stuck. This is nothing new and they often do get jammed. She told me the repair people would be in tomorrow, sometime to fix them but to do just some extra patrol out here tonight. This place sits across the road from a public park and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to bring in homeless at night who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys, and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm nor can we detain anyone. We are simply eyes and ears and to call the police if something comes up. Of course, you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases if you are in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I am to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious, watch the cameras in the security office which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for a day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was really quiet and it rolled around to 3am. I had just sat down to eat my food when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, thanks for calling, resort name here. This is security officer James, how can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked how can I help. The man started to breathe heavier and laughed in silence. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office into the door he was at when it rang again. This time from call box number 2 which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you, they said in this raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. Then the phone rang again. This time I picked up and before he could speak, I let him know the cops are on their way and to leave the property now as he is on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. The guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box as they were a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you, the cops won't make it much here in time, they said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police but honestly the location of this place it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here and I figured this guy was just some homeless guy from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked the back lot just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. 
But a half hour passed, I had finished my food, and was just about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked up and said my normal line, then I heard, Where are the cops? I don't see them, but I see you, the voice said. It was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and did not see anything. I went to the front door to look out there. There was nothing but darkness and a few front floodlights on. I know you're alone, he said. I basically told him to get screwed and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. The next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40 with long, stringy hair poking down in these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest butcher knife I've ever seen and make a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy. He continued slamming his body against the glass trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window but managed to bust his head open, so the window now had blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him and the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on something because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was coming for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores, but this is the last thing I need with this guy running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass, over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones, he would at least be trapped or slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave and yell the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl and then held that knife up again before running to the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't, and while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time his hood had fallen back. He was bald headed with wild, long, stringy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, die die, while making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming it into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looks like and I told him I have camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone and he had driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy and that he would patrol the area and to call back if he came again. It was now nearly 5am when the cop left. I waited until 6am when it was daylight and the people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. This guy literally took all the 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8am, I told her what happened and she said that they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone know who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or who he was. So crazy bloody guy with a knife, let's not meet again. A couple of summers ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in Chiquamigan National Forest in northern Wisconsin, and after our experience, we do not plan to return unless we go with a large group of people. My girlfriend and I are from college, so northern Wisconsin was our go-to place for R&R. &R. We've done a number of hiking trips in northern Wisconsin and in the UP, but never to this area. We are not backpacking experts, but we have been to a number of national parks and have been out hiking and exploring when we can find the time away from work. We love getting away from people and relaxing in nature, but this trip made us appreciate the presence of other people around us in unfamiliar places. Our plan was to hike a remote section of the North Country Trail. The North Country Trail is a national scenic trail, like the Appalachian Trail, but it gets much less use. In some parts of northern Wisconsin, the trail is very remote, and the only access is via logging roads. We planned to hike 15 miles along the trail to a backpack shelter, spend the night, 
and hiked back to the car the following day. We spent the night at a friend's house in Wausau, and we set out early the next day to the trailhead. As we entered the national forest boundary, we were captivated by the beauty of the thick green forest. I drove slowly along the gravel logging roads as we made our way to our own parking spot. While we were driving to the trailhead, we passed a couple of people standing next to a parked truck on the side of the road. They appeared to be campers, as they had a rusted out, bunged up pickup truck. As we drove past, I waved, and they stared back without returning the greeting. Friendly people, I thought to myself. After we passed them, I looked in the rearview mirror and noticed they were still staring at us. And before we rounded a bend, I glanced back into the mirror again and saw them watching us through the haze of road dust. My girlfriend and I joked about the up north people, but we did not think anything of the encounter. Aside from those people, we did not encounter anyone else on the remote logging roads within the National Forest boundary. We found the trailhead about 15 minutes later after winding our way on the narrow logging road. There was no one else parked at the trailhead, a perfect chance to get some needed solitude, fresh air, and relaxation. After parking and making sure the car was locked, we hoisted our packs and set off on the trail. The weather was relatively cool, which thankfully kept the mosquitoes and biting flies at bay. We took pictures along the way, and we marveled at the lushness of the forest and the topography of the glacial moraine. After a solid 8 hours of hiking, we found our campsite. It consisted of a wooden backpack shelter and a fire ring. Even though the shelter provided ample space for us, we opted to set up our tent in a small clearing about 100 feet behind the shelter. We built a fire at the shelter fire ring, and I boiled water for our dehydrated trail food. As we ate, we watched the sky slowly turn dark. My girlfriend and I passed around a Nalgene filled with wine, and we marveled at how many stars you could see away from the city. When the fire was reduced to a small pile of glowing embers, we decided to head back to our tent. We settled into our tent and looked through the pictures we took that day, but after lugging a heavy pack for 15 miles and drinking some wine, I was ready for some shut-eye. When we camped at state and national parks, I usually wore earplugs, but that night, there were no RVs or other campers to make noise, so I closed my eyes and let the noise of the forest lull me to sleep. My girlfriend was very uneasy that night, but she normally had some apprehension whenever we were sleeping away from home. I'm not sure when we drifted to sleep, but we awoke to a bone chilling noise. It was pitch dark outside, and over the insects in the forest, I heard a dull thud. It sounded like someone was hitting two logs together. My girlfriend and I were wide awake at this point, and we lay silently in our tent, hearing the noise again. Our old tent had mesh windows but the backpacking tent we were using had no window. We could only guess at what was making the sound outside our tent. We initially thought that an animal had got our food and garbage bag, which we left in the shelter, but the noise was too distinct, and it did not sound like rustling through food wrappers or our camp equipment. Our hearts were pounding as we heard the persistent knock in the darkness. Unarmed and scared, we did not know what to do. I would normally have carried a can of bear spray, but I decided to leave it at home to save on weight against the wishes of my girlfriend. The knocking continued but we remained still as to not give away our location. For all we knew, whatever was making the noise had already spotted our tent. After what seemed like an eternity, the knocking sound ceased. We lay in complete silence with only the dull buzz of the insects in the background. Then we heard it, leaves rustling, a branch breaking, voices. We heard low talking in the distance. We could not make out what was being said, but it sounded like a couple of people talking in the distance. The voices continued for a bit, but to our relief, the voices did not seem to be getting louder. Whoever was out there did not spot the tent or decided to leave us alone. We sat in our tent for the rest of the night, adrenaline surging through our veins. At the first light, we slowly got out of our tent. I looked around in all directions to see if anyone was out there, but I only saw the forest and the backpack shelter. We quickly rolled up our sleeping bags and camp pads and put our tent away. When we got to the shelter, my girlfriend screamed in horror. On the entrance to the shelter, the wood was freshly cut. The word kill was cut into the shelter wall and there were a number of axe and knife cuts where someone was chopping at the wall. I looked at the ground and saw a scattering of fresh wood splinters. After grabbing our food supply and garbage bag, we got out of there. We were nearly jogging with our gear as we made our way back to the car. I kept glancing back over my shoulder and gazing out through the woods to see if anyone was following us. We traversed the glacial eskers that we saw the day before, and we knew we were getting closer to our car. We were quietly rejoicing as we neared the trailhead. We made it back to the trailhead in near record time, but something was wrong. The windshield wiper on my car was sticking straight up and there was something stuck in the wiper. As we inched closer to the car, I saw there was blood smeared on the windshield and a squirrel carcass was impaled on the wiper blade. Hair and blood still stuck to the wiper and on the hood of the car. I didn't bother cleaning off the car. We threw our gear in the trunk and I sped off without removing the animal from the wiper blade. 
As I sped down the gravel logging road, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, but I could not see anything through the cloud of road dust behind the car. When we got to a gas station by the nearest town, I removed the carcass with a wad of newspaper, and I tried to remove as much dried blood as I could. I filled up on gas so we didn't stop until we made it to Milwaukee. This was the last trip I took to the woods of northern Wisconsin. A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on the Great American Road Trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s, pretty broke, and as my mom had been a long haul trucker, I suggested that to save a ton of money, we would sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut one of them up to make curtains. By the end of the first week we got in so we could set up a camp in about 10 minutes. Luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free campsites, rest areas, basically anywhere it seemed safe and semi-legal. There was never a night after the first night where we felt scared until the last week of the trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and had gotten pretty used to our routine. We didn't go on a set schedule and would never drive more than 3 or 4 hours a day. No destination really in mind, outside a few must-see landmarks. We drive to places we found the night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals, and people we met. We'd also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of people we met at a campsite, in the back of their pickup, because it got hungry and overheard them saying they were going to go. We met an 80 year old cowboy who took us out drinking and taught us to line dance at a country bar, played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm, got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them, spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite. Basically every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This night didn't look out to be any different. We found a free campsite on Google and drove up into the woods, following our GPS. We were pretty far out of town and something seemed a little bit off when we pulled up to the campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. We pulled up near the RV and a man opened the door. Tez waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then, as if she hadn't said anything, he just slowly closed the door again, staring at us the entire time. Figuring he just wanted some privacy and thought we'd be obnoxious, we pulled further down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately while it was still light out, we goofed around for a while, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed out a campfire further down the campsite and we decided to go be friendly. We'd met some pretty cool people in the previous five weeks by just going up and offering beer or just chatting, so we wandered over. Near the campfire there were two men, the owners of the cars we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly and we sat down to chat with them. They were drinking and smoking and we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off, and we came to find out that the two of them didn't actually know one another. The older man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs. However, he seemed harmless. This left us chatting with the younger man, who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing, and we spent several hours just chatting up about our trip, families, everything. Then he started talking about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him and he pulled out his camera to show her photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite, and we both were a little freaked out. It wasn't unheard of us for one of us to go get up to the bathroom in the middle of the night, so the idea of a bear hanging around in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed, and then his expression changed completely. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, if you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear you should be worried about. I kept waiting for the laugh, or for him to nudge Tez with his elbow. Jokes of the foreigner and the city girl, right? He never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed as well and joked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved on to another subject, but within 5 minutes, the ranger had come back to it and was talking about how something grabbing us from our car in the middle of the night. No matter how we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back on. The older man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars, not talking. We would just awkwardly laugh and sip our beer and try to get the conversation going somewhere else. Then the ranger stood up and walked towards the cooler to get another beer. At this point, it's pitch black out, and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. The beer cooler was outside of that circle. Suddenly, there's a red dot in the darkness, and it took a moment for me to realize that it's a camera. The ranger is holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen of the digital camera lit up. Now, it wasn't odd for people we met to ask to take pictures with us. It was an entirely strange thing to have this person taking a photo of us without asking or even indicating that that's what he was doing. We were both staring at him like deer in the headlights at this point, but instead of realizing what he was doing was a bit weird, he checks his camera, adjusts some things, and takes another photo, this time with the flash. No asking us to smile, no proposing a group photo, and no explanation. After this photo, he comes back to the fire and sits down, not a word said about the photo. At this point, me and Tez are mutually freaked out. 
We make some BS excuse that we need to go set up our campsite and nope the heck out. When we stand to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says to have a good night. Ranger, however, looks at us with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes and says, Be careful out there. There's more than bears in the woods. Every hair on my body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rush back to the car, which we only found in the dark by referencing the RV, and jump in the front seats. My friend Tez is all but hyperventilating. Why did he take pictures of us? I was shaking, I responded. I read that serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the car doors. Do you think he just took victim photos of us? We both freaked out. She's in a full panic and turns the headlights on in the car. I immediately yell at her to turn them off, because now he knows exactly where our car is. That is the only night we not set up camp. We didn't need to tear anything down, so we just put the car in drive and floored it out the campsite. As we got into the dirt road, Ranger was walking towards our car with that same cold expression. Ranger, let's not ever meet again. Alright, so that's it. Hope you enjoyed these stories. If you did, consider liking this video and subscribing to my channel. But as always, have a nice day.